Good morning. This is called the Sherpa Three Class. Because we are going to the hill country. My name is Mark Ottenweller. I work with Hope Worldwide. I live in Atlanta where I work with the singles in the North River Church. And this is my lovely and younger wife, <laughs> Lynn Baby on mother. Hi, I'm Lynn, and uh, I get to work with the Edge in North River. I was a single mom for about 11 years. I've been married two years, but I've lived in most of your world. And so to me, it is an honor to get to talk to you because you are my heroes. And together, I think we make a tremendous difference in the church. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm 62. I was married 31 years, uh, five years of single, and uh, two years ago we got married. Amen. So we know, we know what it's like to be married for a while, single for a while, and newlyweds for a while. <laughs> but we want to thank you, really, for your faith Amen. and for your commitment to God. And for all you've done all these years, serving God, loving God, making disciples, doing great things for God, sacrificing, even coming here and uh, making a sacrifice to do that, we're inspired by you Amen. and how you've lived and what you've done for all these years. You know, we're also inspired by some people in the Bible. Amen. There was a guy in the Bible, he... Uh, Confronted Pharaoh, the most powerful man on earth, and his army. He parted the Red Sea, took the Ten Commandments, broke them, remade them, made the people drink the gold of, the, of, the, of Baal, led two million people with the desert 40 years, dealt with rebellion at 80 years old. Wow. That's what it says in Exodus 7. His partner in crime... Aaron was 83. Mm. Together, an 80-year-old and 83-year-old changed the world. Amen. Amen. I meet people that are 50 and 60 and afraid to lead a Bible talk. Mm. <laughs> I'm just telling you. That's what I've heard. <laughs> Moses was 80 years old. He led 2 million people. Wow. wow. It's time for us to rise up, amen? amen. And then this other guy, Caleb, says, give me the hill country at 85. He served the Lord for 45 years. Maybe like some of us. Where did he learn that? What's going to happen in the next generation as they rise up? What's going to be their attitude when they're 50 and 60 and 70 years old? Caleb was inspired by Moses and Aaron to go all the way, give all he could, right to the end. Amen? Amen? And so we have some people like that here today. We're going to share. Let me have Lynn share a little bit about that. Go ahead. You know, it's an amazing thing, but there's never been a time in our lives when we have more to give than right now. That's right. That's right. Recently, I had an appointment with several women in a Bible talk, and they've been around a long time, and they were disillusioned and discouraged and felt not needed, and I just started the meeting by saying, how many years have you been a disciple? Five women, 16, 18. I said, how many years combined do you think you guys have been disciples? Can anyone guess how many years? 91 years. That a lot of, God lot of discipleship. had wow. invested in them. Wow. 91 years they've been in the Word, heard messages, Pray, see miracles. How many years do you think we have in this room? Wow. Come on. <laughs> we fun to tally that. Set the phone down and you add your number, you know, and go, whoa! Awesome idea. <laughs> God has invested in us. That's right. That's God right. pursued us. He relentlessly pursued us. He came after us. Some of us as college students yeah. and That's loved right. us and taught us and trained us. The honest truth is a lot of us come from a generation where we received a lot more training than our younger right. disciples have. That's right. That's we right. have been lavished on by God. That's right. And to whom much has been given, much shall be accepted. That's right. That's right. 
We pray that today as we're together, you will gain a dream that palpates through your vein every day. That's right. That whatever reason you can't will stay in this room. Amen. Amen. That's right. And all the reasons God can will leave with you. That's right. Because God is not done with us. That's right. That's right. And we have a tremendous obligation to the next generation. You know, I told those women in that room, do you know that there are girls that you're intimidated by in their 20 because they're fired up that don't know where to find the book of Ecclesiastes? That's right. You think they're all that, and I'm like, I hope they make it. <laughs> That's right. They need us. That's right. They need our zeal. They need our fire. They need our wisdom. They need our courage. And we need to have and be the inspiration that God has called us to be biblically. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Today I'm honored to introduce you to three people that are tremendous inspiration to Mark and I. That's right. And it's because they have that spirit of resilience. Cornelius Moore is from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Go Red Sox, okay? Ah, <laughs> uh, go Yankees. Uh, but Curtis is a man that has a tremendous love for God and for his word and a yeah. passion that many times in our younger generation we find people having discipleship light when it came to the word. Okay. We were raised on memorizing scripture. We were raised on the word of God pounding through your veins. And we need to revive that. Amen. And we need to give people a faith that will stay with them forever. That's right. And, uh, you know, Pamela Whitney is one of my best friends. Amen. She became a disciple later in life. She was not baptized as a college student. She started Come on. training for the ministry in her 40s. Wow. Let's do it. Let's do it. started working hard to lead women not at That's college right. level and has made a tremendous impact not only here but in Africa. And you'll hear more about that. Karen Durst, I've known since college. Phoenix, let's give it up. And she's from Phoenix, and let me tell you, Karen is a woman of intense fire and fervor who has tackled the younger generation of loving and training. And so you guys are in for a real treat today, and after that we'll have some questions. Really take notes, get inspired, capture the spirit. Amen. Because God will lead us. We don't need That's to right. know everything. We just need to have the heart That's to right. let him lead us. Love you Amen. The incomparable Pam Whitney. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. As, as they said, I'm Pam Whitney. I am from Atlanta, Georgia, and I am so excited to be here today. It's just such an honor to have been able to be selected to be here to share some of my life with you. And so now here I go. First of all, in 1999, um, I had been married for 18 years, and my husband died, and he left me to raise two children, an 11-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter. And to raise them as a single mom was kind of scary for me. Of course, my children and my husband had been pretty much the center of my life, and as you can imagine, I was devastated. After Jean's death, I spent my time just centered around my children and my job and tried to fill my life with that. But unfortunately, it didn't do it. It left me feeling empty, alone, and a lot of times frightened. I'm very thankful to God that about three years later, I became a disciple. Amen. I was 46 years old at that time. And I had some really strong convictions about serving in the ministry. And I just really wanted to serve God any way that I could. I used to actually pray, and I had a little song that I used to sing to myself at night for God to please use me, use me, because I wanted to fill that hole inside where I felt like I wasn't useful anymore. And I'm very, very thankful that there were two very important ways that God helped to answer that prayer for me. He gave me a passion for discipling, Amen. and he gave me a passion for missions. Come on. Okay, so first of all, we have discipling, not because of something that we thought up, but because God designed it that way. That's right. In the 23rd Psalms and in John chapter 10, God gives us a description of the Good Shepherd. Well, this has come to life for me as I look at my life and I see all of the places where God has provided protection, 
protection when I made dumb mistakes, <laughs> you know, guidance, both gentle and harsh, firm, when I needed that nudge, mm -hmm. and encouragement. He gave me relationships that helped me to have the life that I needed to have and to give me people in my life that I could follow examples from and know how to live the way he wanted me. Sometimes I was the shepherd leading other people, but a lot of the times I was the little sheep and people were leading me. So raising my two children alone, as I said, was something I had never envisioned doing. Somehow, you know, you think of other people as single moms, but I just never thought of myself that way. That wasn't going to be me. I actually even have um, my undergraduate and master's degree in child development. So you would think that she would be like, okay, she's got that one. But that wasn't the way it was. I was so scared of being a single mom. It really frightened me. But fortunately, God put women in my life that helped me have some balance. Because that's what I was worried about, not having that balance. Well, that was one of the things. There were many others. I didn't always know I needed advice, because sometimes I thought I knew the answers. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, God knew I needed advice, and he always put the people right there at the right time to give it to me. Amen. I didn't at first, because I, you know, I had been kind of an independent woman, uh -huh. kind of. <laughs> 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 I, didn't, I, I wasn't always in a place of, of doing what people told me to do. I, I had to learn, get some hard knocks, hard lessons. But fortunately, I did learn. Amen. And thanks to God, my two adult children are both disciples. <laughs> I know that the reason for that is because of the shepherding, all the good shepherds, that God put in both my life and my children's lives. Of course, needing discipling didn't end when my kids became adults. I still need it. I st now, it just looks a little different. I need it for knowing how to be, be a good parent to adult children. Because again, remember there's that side of me that wants to control. And I've had to be uh, taught on more than one occasion to let my children be adults and not try to control their lives, but to know how, to know just how to support them and encourage them so that they could do things on their own. So again, God has provided what I needed in that. As I said, at different re seasons of my life, it has looked different. But one thing is very certain, I go after discipling. I find people every stage of the game that can help me. And every, in every single stage of the game, I found that what discipling has done for me is just led me closer to God. Amen. Each situation I've been challenged, and each situation it gets me closer to God. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen over and over again, and I know that it's, it's, it's exciting when you can see where things that perhaps you were discipled on and someone else comes along and has a similar uh, issue in their life and you can help and you can help them just like in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. We can help others with the same things that people have helped us with. That's right. Right. Discipling works. That's right. That's right. Now when considering discipling, most of, all, most of us are going to first think about just like I just mentioned, your, personal, your own personal life. But there's a very, another very important place where God has given me a passion for discipling, and it's in the area of my personal ministry. Now, my first opportunity to serve in the ministry came when I was asked to help uh, disciple some of the young women in campus. That was fun. <laughs> but then later on, I was asked to become a family group leader for The Edge. The EDGE is the acronym for us, for, uh, it, it stands for Every Day God is Enough. And that's what we call our singles ministry at North River, where I am a member. Amen. So um, I came to family group leader. I was motivated, very motivated, but I still had never received any formal training in the ministry. And I needed that. There was so much for me to learn. Um, I'm an example of when you hear people say, you're never too old to learn. Right. Now, sometimes we might have to work a little harder and read it two or three times, but we 
we still can learn. And I can tell you, I was determined because I wanted to be a leader who could lead with wisdom, like Paul teaches us in Colossians 1.28, so as to present everyone perfect in Christ. Amen. What a blessing it was for me, first of all, to have men as my discipler. <laughs> now, I, I, I recognize and acknowledge that that has helped me in a huge way. Lynn and I meet on a regular basis, but it also means participating with her in Bible studies, sitting in on counseling sessions when women have issues and seeing how she talks to them, and having discipling leadership groups. We recently started some um, groups where the leaders would get together and uh, the ones of us who are leading family groups and we discuss issues and talk about different ways and solutions to get it. Those are wonderful D groups and I get a lot. I take advantage of every opportunity there is and I always leave every single time feeling like I've learned something. Amen. I remember the first time that I was asked to lead Bible studies for young women who had uh, left, the ch for a young woman who had left the church and needed to be restored. Now I told you that I started out with campus students. That's a whole different animal. <laughs> but I remember saying uh, restoration, because see, campus students, they don't have that issue. <laughs> so I had to learn about that. This was a new experience for me. And it was so amazing to be in on Constance's studies. Lynn and I went through several restoration studies together, and eventually I was ready to lead the studies myself. Since then, I've had Nancy and Donna and Felicia, and to name a few, so many others. Those are some of the ones I'm just really, really proud of. I can't imagine a better way to have learned how to help these women than going through restoration studies with Lynn and getting trained that way. These sisters were all different, but they had some things that were in common. First of all, these are women who had all been disciples, I mean, had been disciples much longer than I had. They had been faithful women. But along the way, something happened. They had been disillusioned with life, disappointed, they'd fallen into sin, they had a lot of regrets, they were leading unhappy lives. But the most important thing of all is they had some things, one, one very important thing that they had in common is that they all wanted to find their way back to God. Amen. And that's where the whole discipling and restoration came into play, to help them to get back to that place. Amen. All of them benefited from the discipling and from getting trained so that they could get back. Each of them, the exciting thing to me was each one of them returned with a vengeance. And that's one of the amazing things about working with this group of women. They, were, they are awesome. Constance, she became what I call my partner in the gospel. I don't know if you've ever had somebody that you study with, and it's like you, you don't even have to say or which scripture or whatever, or if you get a little block and don't remember it, the other one will remember which one you're thinking about. <laughs> that was me and Constance. Now, Constance was awesome, but unfortunately, Constance left me. Fortunately for her, she got married. <laughs> she moved away to Virginia. Now she's up there with her new husband, and they are gone on to do great things. Felicia, she um, studied, got restored, and now she just recently made a decision to, to let God really be Lord of her life follow his leading, and she's going back home to St. Louis to help her family. Um, Nancy and Donna, those are my two that I call the dynamic duo. <laughs> they work together in such an amazing way. Now, both of them are in uh, leadership D groups, learning to be leaders themselves, and they are helping me with our family group. They are helping to disciple some of the women, they are awesome. Nancy, she is so awesome. She is now even having Bible studies with family members that live around the country and don't live near one of our churches. 
that she recently said, Pam, you got to come over because I want to have a Bible study with one of my family members. I said, okay. <laughs> so we do telephone Bible studies. Amen. So it's just amazing what discipling can do for these women. I've become very close to all of them. Paul refers to Timothy as a dear, true son in First and Second Timothy. Like Paul, discipling these women has given me dear daughters. Many of the campus and singles call me mom, mm -hmm. and I like that. Yeah. <laughs> One of them who's become like very special to me is Tawina. She's my little uh, African daughter from Malawi. Tawina came here as an orphan. Um, her parents had both died, and she came to go to college and all of that. And, and it started out as a discipling relationship, but now she is a true daughter of mine. Yeah. And she is on fire for God, too. Tawina, if I could adopt her legally, I would. But unfortunately, once you reach a certain age, they don't let you legally adopt. <laughs> <laughs> so we know discipling includes loving and caring, but it also is about being open about sin. Mm -hmm. We celebrate our successes, but sometimes we just have to deal with issues that are so complex and pain that is difficult to bear. And in order to help them with these relationships and live in their lives in this uh, crazy changing world, I have to continue to get discipling myself so that I can be an effective leader. Now another way that God has answered my prayer to use me in his service, which is my prayer all the time, God please use me in your service, is by giving me a passion for missions. Uh, Barbara Benville is another one of the sisters at our church, and she and I began with a family group of four mature women. By the end of the first year, we grew to about 10, and they told us our group had gotten kind of big, and they divided or multiplied, however you like to look at that. <laughs> and by the end of our second year, my new group had gotten to 15. The greatest gift really isn't about, about the numbers, even though we like to know that we have been evangelistic and we're sharing our faith and it's important to us, but it's just seeing how God is working in the lives of these women. It's just, it's not a week that goes by that I'm not studying the Bible with somebody or these women aren't or, or something. We just, we're always out there reaching out to people and sharing our faith. Amen. God continues to show me though that it's not by my might, because I know that it's not something that I did. It's by his. Mm -hmm. We can reach out and we can make a difference in the mission field that we live on every day at right. work, at Publix, mm -hmm. wherever you are, you can reach out. And also, that's regardless of our age. Yes. We don't have to be the young college students. Right. We can still reach out on that mission field. Now, as I said, mission has been very important to me, and I've helped with a lot of different uh, service projects. One of my favorites has been a group that we work with in the Edge Ministry called the Center for Children and Youth. And what we do there is different uh, family groups will take turns going over uh, to this residential uh, center. It's a place where children are placed, not because they have uh, have had uh, a bad behavior or anything, but for some reason or the other, they had to be taken from their families. And we go over on a Sunday afternoon and play games and hang out and just be their friend, their mom, their dad, whatever they need. And that's just really been good. And it's amazing how something that's so little can mean so much in reaching out to young people. That's right. It only takes a little bit of our time. Mm -hmm. But even with this, I've had another dream. My big dream for missions had been that I wanted to go on a missions trip someday. And I believe that God, through all the other things that had been happening, all the other opportunities that I had, I think that he had given me all of those things to prepare me for something bigger. And as I, as I learned more about the plight of the children in Africa, and other developing countries, my desire to serve that group increase. I believe that God does give you the desires of your heart. And last summer, my son and I had the opportunity to go to South Africa. Oh, wow. I worked for three weeks with the Early Childhood Development Program there. And I also had the chance to 
work with the single moms. There are so many single moms there. It's, right. it's crazy. So I had the opportunity to do some teaching and just some individual counseling and supporting them with issues with their children. And it was just an amazing experience. Amen. But after returning home, it didn't end then. I was still able to help. I helped by beginning a program or working with Lynn and, and, and Mark and some of the other disciples to start a program that we call Moms to Moms. And this program was a program to empower women through entrepreneurship. Because what we want is to, for these women to be able to have jobs so that they can support their families. Amen. And that's what it was about. And all it took, and sometimes you think things are going to take so much, all it took was for me to find 10 of my friends to donate $100. $100 to those people is like a huge amount. And we think about how much we spend on Starbucks coffee. You know, $100. And that's all it took. And I got those 10 in no time. And we started Moms to Moms, and these women are now going to be able to start businesses and going to be able to support their families. We started out with 10, and at, my, at the last time I talked to the, uh, later over, the lady over at Hope, she said it had come, I think, now to about 25. See how things grow? Yep. And all you have to do is put a little effort. Right. There's no way I can just really give justice to the impact that this experience of going to Africa had on my life. Mm -hmm. It helped me, I know, far more than it ever helped them. Mm -hmm. It has just really uh, increased my desire, first of all, to serve. So I want to do it even more. And it um, helped me to be more mindful about how I'm using what God has given to me. Amen. You know, I can't just waste money and go out and buy things like I used to be able to do. Because I think about if I can do that, I can send it to somebody in Africa or to somebody in my own town. So uh, my dream now is to return to Africa or somewhere, wherever God sends me. And if I can't go there, I'm going to help here in some way, mm -hmm. just like I was able to help with the moms to mom without even being there. Mm -hmm. Those are 10 women that we started out from Zimbabwe who's going to, it's going to change their family's destiny. Mm -hmm. So now I'm at a place in my life, my children are adults, I can take time to pursue my dreams. And my dream is I want to serve God more in such a bigger, in a much bigger way than I ever have. My passion continues to grow. I'm glad about that. And it's not the time right now for me to sit down and rest. Amen. What I want to do now is I want to go wherever God takes me, do whatever he has out there for me. I'm ready for it. Amen. So I'm getting this. <laughs> Now, at age 56, I was able to go on my first missions trip to Africa. So now, I'm leaving you with this. My question is, what is your dream? Ephesians 8.20 says, God can do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. One of, one of my favorite passages, though, is Job 42.12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. I believe this is true for me. And I believe this is true for you. Amen. So I'm excited for my future, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. Amen. Man, good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. That was great. That was awesome. That was inspiring. You know, uh, my name is Karen Moore. I'm from Boston, and uh, I'm 54, amen. I'm 54 years old. Uh, I've been a disciple for about 30 years, and uh, I have a passion for the Word of God and for helping people become disciples. Uh, I remember when I first became a disciple, just really, just reading the Bible, 
over and over and over and over and just memorizing scriptures uh, as many as I could. And I didn't even know that at that time what I was doing to myself. I didn't know that I was, you know, bringing the word into my life. I just loved what I was doing and I just liked what I was reading. And I just wanted to memorize the scriptures because they were so cool. And uh, it wasn't until, I wasn't even, a, and, I, and it wasn't until later when I really got into studying the Bible with people that I realized all that stuff would come back. You know, as I studied the Bible with people, it would just come back. You know, God would use that. But uh, in Ezra chapter 7, you know, at this time in our lives, you know, the world says we need to be looking towards retirement. You know, the world says we need to be thinking about doing less. You know, but that's not what God says. You know, God says age is nothing but a number. So God is not going to be hindered by our age. Amen. In Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, beginning in verse 8, it says, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. For the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. And as we go through the Bible, we will see this same pattern throughout all of scripture. The same pattern of studying, obeying and observing, and then teaching others. It's a pattern that, that Paul taught to Timothy in the New Testament. It's a pattern that Paul told Timothy, teach this pattern to others. It's a pattern that Jesus told and taught to his disciples when he said, you know, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then in Matthew chapter 28, he said, you go and you teach others and make them fishers of men and then teach them how to make fishers of men. So that's a pattern that has been in the scriptures, been revealed in the scriptures from, from all the way from the beginning, even to this very day. So, you know, God has a dream for us. And maybe, you know, when I was younger, you know, I thought about taking the world for Christ you know I thought about leading this and leading that but maybe that's not the dream maybe the dream now for me is to pass on what God has taught to me and not to forget that you know there's a whole generation uh, that's coming up that needs to be taught what we know and believe me God does not want this to go to waste you know the thing that happens to a lot of churches is that you know they kind of fizzle out because you know after one or two generations the younger people don't really know what to do. And the reason that happens is not because they don't love God, it's because the older people didn't transfer what they had learned. So just as important as going out and making disciples, you know, it's also important that we pass on what God has taught to us. Amen. You know, in Ezra where it says that, you know, God's hand was upon Ezra. God's grace was upon Ezra. My question is, at what age would you want that to stop? <laughs> what age would you want God's grace and God's hand to stop being upon you? I don't know about you, but I never want that to happen. I always want God's grace and God's hand to be upon me. So I am like devoted to learning as much as I can uh, about God's word. I remember uh, when I first uh, just really got into the scriptures, you know, I was really into learning, you know, what the Bible taught. I really enjoyed all the stories. I really enjoyed all the miracles. I really enjoy just getting great insight from God you know what I'm saying like I like you know one of the things I believe is that you know I believe that that Jesus discipled John the Baptist now I believe Jesus discipled John the Baptist you know why do you say that because when Jesus was approaching John to be baptized John said hey wait a minute you should be baptizing me but at the time the Bible says that Jesus was only revealed as the Son of God until at his baptism. So John didn't really know that Jesus was the Son of God. But, so why would he make that comment? Because of his relationship with Jesus. Because he had learned so much, he had so much respect and admiration for, for Jesus. That when Jesus came up to be baptized, John was like, no, you need to be baptized in me. And he didn't even know he was the Son of God. 
But you know, that was an insight that I believe God just gave me from the scriptures. You know, I've never heard anybody really say that. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but I believe God just gave me that little tidbit. And there's more things like that. <laughs> there's more things like that that I believe that God has given to me because I just love to study his word. Now, in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. And I'm sure you guys get some great stuff from your study of God's word as well. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he had suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, that's some great stuff right there. But the writer of Hebrews didn't even get into finishing that. He said, you know what? We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. You know, uh, the writer of Hebrews encountered this situation where there were some great things that he was ready to reveal about Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I love learning about Jesus. And here's a situation where he's about, to, he's about to shed some knowledge about Jesus. He's about to shed some deep insight about Jesus. But he says, but I can't do it. I can't do it because you guys are slow to learn. Now, something had happened with these disciples that it... I don't know how old they were. I don't know how long they had been disciples. But there is a reference in here where he says, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Amen. By this time, you ought to be teachers. So obviously, they had been a disciple for some time there. And so the fact that they had not yet become teachers means that, man, something was going on that they were being slow to learn. And I don't know about you. I don't want that to be said about me. Man, I'd love to reveal some deep insight to you, but I can't because you're so slow to learn. And what is the problem with that? The problem is that I'm probably not passing on what I'm learning. In that process, we talked about at the beginning of, of studying and observing and obeying and then passing on to others. If any part of that process breaks down, you know we end up at the point where we're deceived. And that's what the Bible teaches in James, that if, if we don't put into practice and obey what we see in the Word of God, we deceive ourselves. And what is that deception about? That deception is not just about, oh, I think I'm this great guy when I'm really not. That deception is about, I think I'm going to heaven and I'm really not. <laughs> that's the deception, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's the deception. I think I'm right with God and I'm really not. And uh, so I've got to pay attention to this, man, that, you know, I want to make sure that, wow, you know what? I want to make sure that the Bible is teaching that, man, I need to study his word and observe it and put it into practice and then pass that on to others. I want to make sure I'm doing that. Amen. Amen. So I've always wanted to know more, but, you know, at the age of 50, you know, I wanted to, I started to learn about how to read the Bible. Um, what am I saying right here? Uh, in the past, I think, I, I, I picked up the Bible and I read it the same way all the way through. I mean, I read the book of Psalms the same way I read the book of James. Uh, I, I read the book of Hebrews the same way that I read the book of Proverbs. And uh, at about the age of 50, I learned that there's a difference in the books of the Bible and the purpose and the reason for what they was written for. And so I decided that, hey, you know what? I need to learn this. You know, the book of Psalms was written, basically those are the prayers of Israel. You know, God inspired the writers of the book of Psalms to write those down and record those so that in worship they could be read aloud back to him. That's why he did that. You know, when you look at the Psalms, the Psalms follow a particular a progression. You know, there's a part in there where they praise God. There's a part in there where they get mad at God. There's a part in there where they realize how great God is, and there's a part in there when they come back. When you read the Psalms, they pretty much all follow that progression. You're David, God, God you're great, you're awesome, but why are the wicked progressing? Yeah. You know, what, what's, I'm, I'm righteous, why aren't I progressing? 
And then he says, you know, but, you know, God showed me the end of the wicked. And so I was able to come back and praise him. And the Psalms will follow that progression. And so, man, I learned that about the Psalms. You know, I learned about the, the Gospels. You know, you read those differently than you read the epistles. You know, the epistles are basically letters. You know, if the love of your life wrote you a letter, how would you read it? You sit down and you read it all the way through. You want to read every word of it, right? And basically that's what God has done with the epistles is he's written us these great letters. And so we want to sit down and read them all the way through and read them through again. You know, then separate it into, into, different, in, into different categories, into different uh, uh, issues and, and facts of life that he's trying to address there. And so I was like, wow, this is fantastic. And so that really helped. My study of the Word of God, amen? amen. <laughs> the other thing about, uh, the other thing is that I really love uh, just studying the Bible with people. In uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 16, you know, Jesus said to the apostles, said to those following, he said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You know, God had one son, and what did he make him? A fisher of men. I mean, when you look at Jesus Christ, that's who he is. I mean, that's what he came to do, right? He came to catch souls, save men, save women, women, and bring them to heaven. Yeah. And then he said to his disciples, I want you to become like me. So what is God's vision for each of us? You know, God has a vision for each of us. And that vision is... Jesus Christ. God wants each of us to be just like his son. In Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, I didn't go to 116. I just kind of quoted it. So if you went there, you're awesome. <laughs> so in Romans chapter 8, I will try to read this one. In Romans chapter 8, In verse 28, it says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he, he, who he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You know, there's this sentence in there where it says, He conformed, he pre also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So if God had one son, and his one son is a fisher of men, and his vision for us is to be like his one son, you know, what are we gonna be? We're gonna be fishers of men. You know, God has given us that purpose and that mission in our lives, and it never goes away. It doesn't go away at the age of 54. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't disappear. You know, age is not going to make that just disappear. You know, we are still becoming more and more like Jesus. And so what I do is I will find, I will find any study or any person that wants to study, and I will make sure that I am involved. I make sure that I am involved. I mean, so, but at the same time, I need to be able to pass on, you know, what I've learned. And so uh, we've got a guy that's getting baptized tomorrow. Amen. And uh, there's a man, it's awesome. There's a man that, that I disciple that um, I allowed him just to lead the whole study from beginning to end. And uh, there are times when he wanted, hey, are you going to be there? Are you going to come? Are you going to be there? No, I'm not coming. <laughs> no. Nope. Well, we, I don't know. I, we need to figure this out. I need to figure that out. Okay, man, I'll pray for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray for you, man. And every once in a while, I would check in. I'd show up. Hey, how's the study going? You know, great, great. Or I talked to the man studying the Bible. How's it going? How you doing? Great. It's awesome. And he's like, I want to get baptized. I was like, what? That's awesome. That's amazing. And you know what? Uh, he's learning. You know, this young man is learning You know how to study the Bible with people. All because I just kind of stepped back a little bit because, and let him do it. He had been coming with me, you know, as I'd been studying the Bible with other people. So he had seen how I do it. And I had been in on a couple of studies with him, and uh, I kind of gave him some instructions as we were going through the studies and kind of encouraged him to do this or, or to move along, don't get bogged down, this kind of thing, whatever. And uh, so we did it that way. And uh, finally, I just said, okay, go do it. And uh, he's done it. You know, he's done it. And he's about 20, he's about 26 or 27. So he's a younger man, you know what I'm saying? And so he's, he's getting that vision of being a fisher of men. 
And uh, when I study the Bible with people, you know, I give them that vision. Hey, you know what? You're going to be doing this. You know, you're going to go out and find your friend. And you're going to sit down and you're going to study the Bible with him. You know, it's not going to be me. It's going to be you studying the Bible with him all the way from the beginning to the end. So, um, you know, I believe that, you know, God, you know, gives us, you know, that purpose and that mission. And he wants us to pass that on to make sure that get passed on. And we're the ones that are in the best position to do that. You know what I'm saying? So, brothers and sisters, uh, let's rekindle that fire for the for the word of God and for making disciples and for training others. You know, let's not forget that that's a part of God's mission for us. Being able to pass on what we've learned. Amen. Thank you. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Karen Durst. I have been a disciple since I was 18 years old. That was a really long time ago, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, as a young disciple, I had many, many amazing women and men in my life that taught me so many things about what it meant to be a, a follower of Jesus. And I think as time's gone on, um, you know, that whole scripture about Titus uh, 2, 3 saying, hey, you know, older women teach the younger women. And I had some amazing women doing that for me. And as I was going along, all of a sudden I stopped and I thought, oh no, I'm an older woman. <laughs> and I was like, when did that happen? You know? So then I had to, I, I realized I had to have that same conviction because those women had the conviction to teach me the things that I needed. And all of a sudden I realized I have that same responsibility. And like Lynn said earlier, to whom much is given, much is expected in God's eyes. And so we have to make sure that we're doing the same thing. You know, God didn't give me physical children. Um, and I think that was for a reason, because he knew there were lots of women out there that really needed, and men too, that needed help in a mother kind of way. And so since I moved to Phoenix, it's just been an amazing time. <laughs> Do you guys realize that there are 221 verses that talk about training in the Bible? Mm. I was like, wow, that's pretty intense. You know, and the first thing that came to my mind is, you know, we think about that scripture. Everybody knows Matthew 28, 18. I love how the spirit works because Corinthians said that first. Um, but it, it, we always think about, oh, go make disciples. But what's the second part of that verse say? Teach them to obey. But you know what I thought about? Are we obeying? You know, if we're not being the light, if we're not being someone that they can follow, how are we going to teach them? Because these younger people, they're, they don't really care what you say. They want to see what you're doing. And they're going to follow what they see. So we can either be showing them that Jesus still is Lord in our lives, no matter what age we are, or we can be sitting back making excuses. And here's some things that I've heard. Well, you know... I have all these health problems. You know what? I do too. Um, well, I'm not married. Well, me neither. In fact, I got divorced in the kingdom. Um, my finances are a mess. Well, you know what? So are mine, and that's my thorn. I'm really working on it, and hopefully that'll work out. Um, my children are having problems. They're not disciples. I'm raising grandchildren. You know, I, can't, I haven't birthed any children, but I have lots of spiritual children that are having issues and having those problems. Well, what about my job and my career? There's so many things going on. I'm not happy there. I've got problems with that. But you know what? As a disciple over my life, I've left three jobs because it got in the way of my relationship with God. And I think there are times that we let those things creep back in and we don't have conviction about what God says. And we listen to what the world says about our relationship with God. You know, God says, I'm going to take care of you. He says, seek first the kingdom and all else will be given to you. Do you really believe that? Because it's true. And if you do what God says, he'll take care of you. You know, God's not going to take care of our excuses when we come back. He is not going to accept those excuses. He wants us to do what we can do. And the first thing I want you to think about is just focus on what you can do. You know, sometimes we think, oh, well, I don't have anything to give to anybody. Well, you know, sometimes you just need to do what you need to do with what you got. That's right. You know, instead of focusing on all the things we can't do, we need to focus on what we can do. What do you have that you can give? Well, first of all, deal with your own stuff. You know, if you, you know, like Pam was talking about with getting discipling. You know, as we get older, I know for myself, it wasn't until I was in my late 40s that I started dealing with my junk. 
You know, some of the emotional garbage that I had from my past with, as a child. And, you know, all those things that sometimes as, as we've grown up in the kingdom, we haven't really dealt with those emotional things. You know, we've worked on being what we need to be as disciples, and we've worked hard. And, you know, my codependent issues and the things I've done fit real well into the kingdom of God. Um, but the things I did were not for God. They were for me. They were for me to get my emotional needs met and me to take care and make look good and all that stuff. But it wasn't about serving God and loving people well. So it took me being willing to sit still and look at that stuff. And I think sometimes we're so busy doing stuff, we forget to be still and let God be God. You know, and if you're not being still with God, you know, and people that know me know this is my soapbox, you have to be still. You have to be still to know God. You have to be still to know yourself. And you have to be still to know how to help the people around you. Because God's the one that's going to give you that. You're not that smart. I'm not that smart. You know, God is that smart. So we have to take the time to be still. You know, at the beginning of um, moving to Phoenix, there was this one woman that um, had been praying. She was 25, and she's like, I need a spiritual mom that can help me. So we just kind of ended up there at the same time, and she ended up moving in with me, and then another one moved in with me, and, and now that's just been the pattern. And both of them are married now, and now I got new ones, but, you know, it's like... <laughs> and at one point, I was sharing a 615-square-foot apartment with um, one of the young 20-somethings, and we were sharing a bedroom. I'm 50-whatever, and you know she's, she's 29, and we're sharing a bedroom. And people were like, that's crazy. I'm like, yeah, it is. But you know what? That was amazing time. Because we can get so set in our ways that we get so selfish that we don't look outside, you know? <laughs> we have to get past our noses and our belly buttons. We've got to look out and see what the needs are around us. You guys are important to what God's kingdom needs right now. And you've got to quit feeling like you don't have a place. You know, if you are feeling like you don't have, that, that you're lonely, well, you know what? There's a whole bunch of young people out there that feel the same way. And you know what? The Bible says you go out and teach and train them. Don't sit back and wait for them to come to you. Get out there and do what God's calling you to do. Yeah. You know, I, I've talked to some women, even as far as, you know, women that are coming back. What are you doing even to reach out to the women that are coming? Do you now look around? I mean, we were trained as young disciples. When you go to church, look around and see where the visitors are. Right. Do you still do that? Do you still go up and find the people that are sitting there by themselves looking scared? You know? Get out of yourselves. Go back to what you were taught when you were younger. Go back to what you know. Go back to your first love. You know, the other thing is, a lot of these young men and women, campus singles that are becoming Christians, they have no idea what family is. You know, our generation, we grew up with, you know, lots of aunts and uncles and people around us and, you know, moms and dads around. A lot of these young people have, don't have that. And even if they did have moms and dads, a lot of times they weren't together. Um, a lot of them had a lot of really negative things going on in their home life. They don't really understand family. So as they come into God's family, they're bringing that junk there with them. So it's our job to help them know what family's supposed to be like. And so we have to get in there and teach them and train them. And, you know, it's like we have all kinds of things going on in their lives. You know, this, you know, crazy junk, the anxiety, the, you know, and they text. Oh, they text. Text crazy. I mean, they'll, I'll get texts. It'll go blow on my phone, boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, what the heck? Why don't you just call me? You know? And I'm like, just pick up the phone, you know? But that's how they communicate. So if you don't text, if you don't do those things, do it. You know, get in there. Um, be what they need you to be as well. But then teach them and say, hey, you know, if you have a lot you want to talk about, let's, let's have coffee. Let's sit down and talk about this face to face. Because they don't know how to com communicate that way. They don't know how to do things that they need to do face to face because they're so used to technology. I remember one of my roommates, she had a car accident. She called me, Karen, could you come get me? And before I could get there, she already had posted a picture of her car on the Facebook. And I'm like, <laughs> And I was only 10 minutes away, so, you know, I'm like, wow, you know, what is that? I don't understand that, you know? I don't want my junk out there like that, but, you know. So those are things we have to teach them and train them and get in there with them about. We have those things, and it's up to us to get in there and help them learn that. Amen. They need you guys, you know? I've had these 20-something roommates for a while now, and, you know, 
a lot of these women have no idea what a godly mom or dad's supposed to be like. And they need you to be that for them in the fellowship. You know, don't, you know, I hear these things about, oh, well, the age difference in the singles ministry. I love that about the singles ministry. I love that we have 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds and 80-year-olds. You know, when I went on the mission team to Macon, we had this group of older women, very old women, like, you know, 70, 80-year-old women, and they were amazing. Now, as we get older, we can't do the things we used to do, but our brains still work, you know? I might not be able to go do those things, but I sure can talk, you know? So these women, um, they became known as the wise women, and what we did is women interceding specifically for evangelism. I gave them a charge, and they would sit, and once a month we'd go have lunch, we would talk about a, a ministry, a city, and a country in the world, and they would start praying for that month about those ministries. We need people that will intercede for our churches, that will intercede for, for the cities, for the ministries. And then we had prayer cards, and the church would give us the prayer requests. I'd dole them out to the wise women, and we would pray about it. And then whenever the prayer was answered, we'd celebrate, which gave glory to God and not us. You know, that it's all about God. And so we've got to be willing to go, and we have to be willing to be in there with them. And you know what I found out? Um, they challenge me more than anybody else. Um, living with these 20-somethings, you know, as you get older, sometimes you take the attitude, well, you know, so I'm not being challenged, or and nobody's willing. Are you approachable enough to let a 20-year-old challenge you about something? Well, let me tell you something. My roommates, they don't hold back. And um, when I hurt their feelings, which I tend to do, um, especially with one of them, they come right at me and they tell me, you know, Karen, when the way you said that, it's really harsh and hard, and I need you to not do that anymore. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, and I'll pray about that. Um, but they see. <laughs> But you know what? One day, one of them challenged me on gossip. Because being a good teacher, it's really easy, and administrator, it's really easy to fall into. And so it really caught me. So, But she saw me study it out and then come back and talk to her about it. They need to see us do that, guys. You know? Um, in Ezekiel 44, 23, it says, They are to teach my people the difference between the holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. They need us to teach them and train them how to be godly. They've come out of the world. They don't know what it means to be like Jesus or to apply the scriptures to their lives. They need us to help them do that. But you know what? You guys need to do it. We need to do it. We need to make sure that our lives are being reflective of what God is calling us to do. You know, you need a passion for God that they can see. Do you? You know? They need you to be available to them. Are you? They need you to be in your Bible, to be praying every day. Are you? They need to see your relationship with God. They need to see your faith. They need to see how you apply the scriptures to things. They need to see how you deal with conflict. They need to see how you do the things that you need to do with sharing your faith. Take them with you. Teach them. You know, live life with them. You know, and sometimes it's not even about the spiritual aspects of all those things. What about teaching them how to cook? You know? What about teaching them how to sew or to clean a house? You know? When, <laughs> this story's really funny. I uh, had thrown my back out and I was uh, flat in, on my back, couldn't move. And one of my roommates, um, she was having to do everything and, and she tends to have, you know, some selfishness issues. Um, and so she was really having a hard time having to do everything because we have a little dog and we have the house, you know, and we had this, uh, we had some people coming over on Sunday. So in my mind, well, you clean the house before you have guests. That's just what we do, right? Well, she's like, oh, I'm, it's Saturday. We're there coming over Sunday. Oh, I'm going to go out. I said, well, did you mop the floor? And she's like, no. Well, I said, well, when are you going to do that? Well, I don't know. You know, and she's like, because sh they don't think that way. We think that way because we've been trained that way. And most of us even had moms that taught us that. Many of these women don't. So she had the biggest attitude with me because I asked her to clean the floor before she went out. You know, but those are the kind of things that we have to train them in. Because hospitality is important. Amen. Hospitality is how we bring people into our homes and how we, we show people God's love. Are we teaching them those things? And brothers, you too. 
You know, there are things that you can teach these young men and these young women. They need to see godly examples of men in their lives. They need to see men that respect them, that look out for them, that protect them. And that's your job. So make sure you're doing that. We cannot let Satan have the victory over these things because he wants to destroy this younger generation. He wants to take us out. I mean, my, one, my other roommate the other day, just a couple days ago, said, Karen, is there anything that would make you stop um, com- or would, would make you leave God? And I was like, girl, after 35 years, no, there is nothing because I've been too hard, I've worked too hard, too long, gone through too much stuff to give up now. Because I want to see Jesus. You know? So you guys, I know you do too. So let's get in there. Let's deal with the stuff we need to deal with. Let's take a hold of the vision that God has given us as men and women of God. Just because we're older doesn't mean we're dead. You know? for what he can do with our lives. And you need to start grabbing hold of it again and not letting Satan have the victory because we have an enemy and he wants to take you out. His job is to kill, steal, and destroy. And he will do it if you let him. But we have a choice and we need the younger generation to take care of us when we can't. Isn't that what I told you? (laughs) These people are taking us to the hill country. Is that right? I'm just telling you. You know, I was thinking as Karen was sharing, I have a young guy, I've been mentoring a lot, and he says, uh, he comes over, I say, yeah, let's do the wash on, wash off. He calls me Mr. Miyagi. (laughs) Let's have Lynn share a little bit now. That's great. Great. So do you remember? Do you remember when you made Jesus Lord? Yeah. That's right. I want you to stop a second. Do you remember the vow you made to him? And why you made it? Because somebody decided to pull you out of this horrible, ugly world, yeah. dust you off, and make us useful. Yeah. Yeah. He's been faithful. And I understand, because I've been around, you know, I was expected man when I became a disciple and I gave it all to God I had this God bubble around me and nothing would ever happen. Did any of you else think that? I don't know where I got that it's not in the Bible but I sure believed it was and when the bubble burst life wasn't what I thought it was my husband got diagnosed with a brain tumor when I was in my late 20s and given a year to live lost nine people in seven years, My my two brothers my dad I know that this room is filled with stories like that. Come on. I know that my story sounds like nothing compared to some of yours. But I'm saying this because I am tired of seeing Satan kick us around with yeah. life. That's right. Let me tell you, it's not going to stop, okay? That's We're right. not going to get cuter and younger and healthier, okay? <laughs> Nobody, and I'm not about to hand it over. That's right. And some of us are handing it over. Some of us are just backing off like somebody took away what you gave up. Nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can. We are so important to the movement. That's right. That's right. When I was growing, my mom is my hero. She's 80 some years old and I try to be like her every day. I try to pray as much as she does. She prays more than I do. She walks closer to God more than I do. I feel sorry for myself. I told her once, I said, Mom, you live in government subsidized housing. You are a missionary. You've given up everything for God. Do you ever feel bad about being in this tiny apartment? She laughed at me and said, Honey, I never forgot what I deserved. I deserved hell and I didn't get anything short of that spine with me. Did you forget what you deserved? We don't deserve good health. We don't deserve a husband. and We might get it along the way, but what we don't deserve, we got. Salvation. 
we can walk to the end of this life with a God who adores us Amen. and spend eternity with him. Amen. Junk it out. I pray that when you leave this room today, there's a passion and a fire in you that permeates the group, that in your ministries, people look at you and say, I can't wait to be your age. That's right. Because I've never seen anything like it. I look forward to the days to come because I see what walking with God does in a congregation. That's right. Remember that registration you paid? You got it today, right? Five to ten minutes. Yeah. Can you follow that? Yeah. I want you to follow it. Three questions. Something on your heart, let's take them. Something on your heart, stand up. Three questions we have time for. Yes. Loud. I'll repeat it in the mic. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. Oh my gosh. That's what I was going to talk about. That's what I was going to finish with the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. And God put something on your heart, and it's your vision, and you take it back. You bring it to your ministry, and you share your dream. And they don't buy into your dream. And because your dream isn't bought into, you become discouraged. And then you got to deal with God and your inobedience to Him. What is your advice? Good question. Good wow. question. That's the question. After have to repeat the question for the, uh, for the microphone. The question is, when the Holy Spirit puts something on your heart, and you pray about it, and if you're sure that that's what God wants you to do, and you go back to your ministry, and people don't have the same vision and dream. I never give up. Amen. In Acts 2, it says that God poured out His Spirit on all people. It says that He poured it out in those days, His Spirit. And that very Spirit gives us visions and dreams. Because those visions and dreams are from the Holy Spirit. And so in Joel 2 and in Acts 2, that's what it says. You know what I was praying as we sat here? I was praying that God would pour out His Spirit on you. Amen. And we give all of you visions and dreams. And that together as a group today, we could all pray for all the young people here at the conference. And that God would pour out His Spirit on them. And all the young people that come here, thousands of young people, that God would give them visions and dreams for their lives. And I don't think we should ever give up on that dream. Ever, ever, ever. Because those visions and dreams are from God. Amen. And so whether He fills them today, or tomorrow, or next week, or next year. I went to Africa when I was 38. Mm -hmm. Now Lynn and I got married two years. I got married when I was 60. Amen. There are a lot of different chapters in your life. Yeah. Now I'm married to Lynn. You can imagine what things we want to do together. Yeah. We're turning over a new chapter. Amen. But that's what I pray. I got to pray, point your spirit on me. To help me to understand how and when and where we can do what you want me to do. Awesome. But that's all brought to us by the Holy Spirit. I think that the group here is the key to the conference. Yep. Yeah. Because I think we have dreams. Yep. Yes. And the young men and women need to have visions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we can pray every day while we're here at the conference. We're walking around among the young people. Give all these young people visions. Yep. Yeah. Give them dreams. Give them people they can imitate. Help me to be the person I need to be to, to, that they can imitate as they grow up in Christ. And so let's never give up our dreams. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And let's then pray the young people have the vision that they need to have. Here. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that there have been many times I've been in that situation. And the thing I've learned is those people who are the ministry leaders are not God. Amen. God is God. And if God wants that to happen, it will happen. That's right. But You said Jesus is Lord whether anybody else does. And it's your that's job right. to show up whether nobody else does. That's right. And that's what I've learned, whether if it's just me. I've that's done right. Bible talks and I'm like, here's what we're going to do. And I'm going to be there every single time whether you're there or not. That's right. And you know what? You keep doing that, people will follow. But you have to do it and you have to be the example and let God lead. I love that question. It's a great question. And uh, think about Moses, and I'm sure that when Moses, you know, left Egypt and finally realized who he was, that he was a Hebrew, 
uh, that he wanted his people to be free. But God said, not yet. I know you got a vision, but not yet. And uh, it wasn't until that Moses was actually ready to be used by God that God allowed it, that vision to come true. So I would say maybe there might be some timing issues in there to think about as well. The other thing is that when someone comes to me and says, hey, can we do this? You know, I really love to do this. The first thought that goes to my mind is, am I going to be doing that or who's going to be doing that? <laughs> who's going to be making that happen? Is that, you know what I'm saying? If that's me, I ain't got time to do that, you know? But uh, if, uh, so that could be a little bit of what's going on as well. When they hear your vision, they're probably thinking, well, she's trying to put me to work. So. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I would warn you that we have to watch as we get older is bitterness. So if someone says, no, that's not a right reason for me to be unrighteous. I need to guard my heart. Some of you might feel like, well, I'd be leading my ministry if they'd let me. You know, we've got to watch our hearts to be righteous because we will not see the face of God without a pure heart. And so I think when I've had those moments when I um, was told that they didn't want me to lead anything and I, I mean I was like, oh my goodness, you were trained in New York, who wants you to lead, you know? I was like, okay, then I'll go lead a kids group for my daughter. There's something we can always do until God opens the next place. As long as our heart stays tender and righteous and united with leadership so that people see that we're there to serve and to love. We're not there to do our thing. Mm -hmm. And then the Holy Spirit will move in everyone's life because Amen. we've been righteous. Amen. 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 That, that was a great question. <laughs> let's, uh, let's pray. Amen. Dear Lord, pour out your Spirit on us. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us faith. Help us to be compelled by your Spirit moved by your spirit, enabled by your spirit, convicted by your spirit, that we would be the men and women we need to be till the day we die. Amen. That we'd rise up and be great disciples, that we'd get discipling, that we'd get training, that we'd love your word, we'd have a passion for your word, for discipling and for helping and discipling young people. But right now, dear Lord, we pray you part your spirit on all these young people at this conference, that they'd have visions and dreams for